Uh, I would like to welcome everybody to the RNA Innovation Seminar Series that is organized by the Center for RNA Biomedicine here at the University of Michigan. And uh, my name is Mats Jungmann. I'm the co-director of the Center for RNA Biomedicine. And uh, I have the distinct pleasure to introduce to you today's speaker, uh, Carla Neugebauer from Yale University. Um, Carla is a, the professor in molecular biophysics and biochemistry and also in cell biology. She is the director of the Yale Center for RNA Science and Medicine. She's also directing the graduate program in her department. Um, just a little short uh, rundown of uh, Carla's academic journey. So she got her bio, uh, Bachelor of Science from Cornell uh, then she thought it would be nice to see the, the ocean. So she went to UCSF in San Francisco as a graduate student in neurosciences. Uh, after getting her PhD, she uh, went up uh, the coast to Seattle where she joined Mark Roth uh, lab at Fred Hutch. And then she thought, well, my last name is German. So maybe I should go to Germany. And she did go to Heidelberg for two years to do a second postdoc. Uh, but then she went back to Seattle again and uh, got a faculty position at the University of Washington in the Department of Neurology. But she didn't stay there very long. She uh, Maybe people mispronounced her name enough times, so she decided to go back to Germany again. And uh, she was a group leader for 12 years at the Max Planck Institute in Dresden. And then in 2013, she decided to come back to the US uh, and this time on the East Coast and to Yale University. Um, Carla is well known for her seminal work on transcription, uh, transcriptional and post-transcriptional processing of RNA and also now very interested in uh, the phase separated uh, nuclear bodies. And we're gonna hear more about that today. She's also very active in the RNA um, uh, community. She has held many positions in the RNA Society and she's very busy organizing uh, some very nice Cold Spring Harbor meetings and Gordon conferences and I saw that next year she is organizing uh, a very interesting meeting called Post-Transcriptional Gene Regulation and that is uh, the topic or, or the title of her talk today is in that area. It's Dynamics of co-transcriptional pre-mRNA processing and assembly of related biomolecular condensates. Welcome, Carla, and, and please take it away. Thank you, Mats. You promised me that you would only um, say a few words. That was quite a long introduction. <laughs> so I hope everyone can see me and my um, presentation. Please tell me if you can't. Okay, I'm not hearing anything. Great. Um, and so, yeah, today I'm going to be telling you um, two stories. The first story is about the dynamics of transcription and splicing. And then I'm hoping to have a short question break so that if you have uh, questions on that first part, I could answer a few of those questions at least um, uh, before getting started on the second part where I have some really exciting new information about um, how these beautiful cahal bodies, these, this here is a section of a zebrafish embryo, uh, these bright green dots in the nucleus of zebrafish embryos here, and also all- Carla, Carla yes. you'll have to share your screen, please. Or not ah, I have shared my screen. So that's very fascinating. Okay, <laughs> apologize. Um, good, thank you for telling me that that uh, got switched off. <laughs> Brilliant. I didn't get too far. And I'll get back into the presentation. Great. Yeah, okay. Can, are you seeing this presentation now? Yeah, it looks great, Carla. Terrific. I'm terribly sorry. I must have hit something at the last minute. Okay. Anyway, these are the bright green things I was talking about. Terrific. Okay, so let's get started on um, the first story. Um, and so I want to begin by reminding you about pre-mRNA splicing. I realize that this audience doesn't need much reminder 
Um, but for everyone uh, to be kind of caught up to speed about what I'm going to speak about, um, I love this diagram by Sebastian Fica that summarizes um, how the different components of the spliceosome, namely the SNRPs, associate with the pre-mRNA uh, diagrammed here as an exon, an intron, uh, followed by exon 2, um, and showing the splice sites. Uh, we're not going to be massively dwelling on the splicing mechanism today, but rather the dynamics during transcription. But I want to remind you that these uh, components, U1, U2, and the trisnerp, join in a stepwise fashion with the pre-mRNA. And through several steps of spliceosomal activation, we get to then the two tr um, transesterification reactions that lead to the formation of the lariate intermediate. And then finally, um, through step two to the spliced product, of course, the mRNA. And the other product is the lariate. Um, and we're going to come back to uh, this in just a second. But I want to point out that in contrast to um, transcription, splicing is especially burdensome for cells. And that's because for any given transcript in the cell, it takes one RNA polymerase II molecule, but it takes a lot of spliceosomes to make that transcript. And in humans, where you have eight or nine or even 10 or 10 um, as an average number of introns, you're going to need 10 spliceosomes, whereas you only needed one RNA polymerase II um, to synthesize that transcript. So this is very demanding on the cell. Um, they have to synthesize all of this machinery uh, to assemble spliceosomes. Um, it also means that since a lot of splicing, as I'll tell you, is co-transcriptional, chromatin is full of spliceosomes and RNA binding proteins. And in fact, there can be crosstalk between transcription, chromatin, and splicing, as you may know. So coming back to this little diagram here, uh, I want to focus back in on, on the products of splicing the lariat. And then what disassembles is uh, the remnants of the spliceosome. And what I want to remind you of is that these SNRPs that disassemble are no longer functional for splicing. In fact, they have to be reassembled into these active SNRPs. And a great example is the tri-SNRP here that's comprised of U4 and U6 and yield together. Uh, together with their proteins and the U5 SNRP. And the, this SNRP, the tri-SNRP, assembles in a subnuclear organelle called the Cajal body. And so this is bringing in the, the sec sort of second theme. So just to come to a kind of cartoon depiction of what we'll be talking about today then, we have the Cajal body where the um, inactive uh, SNRPs can get assembled into active SNRPs. And we're going to talk about how those call bodies are associated with the active gene loci that encode the snRNAs or the, the non-coding RNA sub, um, components in those um, spliceosomal subunits. And then what we're going to delve into now is what the nascent RNA really looks like as it's being synthesized at the gene. Here's the gray polymerase moving along and associating with different components, uh, the cap binding complex, for example, and different um, splicing uh, components, and then asking, you know, how efficient, for example, is splicing co-transcriptionally, and how is it related to the process of transcription? So the, I first want to start out by telling you why I think this is interesting. Uh, in the good old days when we were doing in vitro splicing reactions and so on, we thought with, that we were mimicking splicing by making splicing constructs. Actually, the constructs didn't look like this. This is how you would imagine the pre-mRNA to look if the polymerase were to transcribe an entire gene and kind of get to the end and no processing was happening. The pre-mRNA substrate would be really long and contain all of the introns. Um, and so we imagine that this might be the substrate for splicing. And indeed, as I alluded to, the in vitro splicing reactions we were doing to understand some of the biochemistry, we're really modeling splicing on introns with exons um, as individual exons. But the thing I find fascinating to imagine is if splicing occurs co-transcriptionally, then what could be happening, let's take an extreme example, as the polymerase moves into intron one, uh, if splicing occurs very efficiently, what you can imagine is uh, exon one just gets longer and longer as uh, additional exons start to get spliced to it, let's say. Um, here you can see an example where polymerase is moving along and carrying with it some uh, 
introns have been removed, well, and then there are other introns that are that are still present. So what are the substrates for splicing inside of cells? That's our question. And where along the gene does splicing take place? And what I mean by that is where is RNA polymerase II when a given splicing reaction takes place? Maybe that's important. Maybe there are important chromatin, chromatin marks that have to do with um, the splicing reaction itself. And something that we're gonna to come to is the question of whether RNA processing could be coordinated at the single transcript level. And uh, I think we'll see that, that it does seem to uh, be coordinated. Okay, so our system for today is uh, erythropoiesis. Uh, and this is the thesis work of Kirsten Reimer. And what she did was she took a cell culture model of erythropoiesis, MEL cells, mouse, erythroleukemia cells, and she took them through a series of uh, developmental stages so that she could look at the transition from cycling cells to globin producing, largely globin producing um, erythropoietic cells. And uh, <clears throat> uh, what she's going to be doing is purifying nascent RNA using sedimentation and washing of the chromatin, so a mechanical isolation of chromatin and the analysis of the RNA that's associated with that chromatin. And the, oops, sorry, yes. Um, and the method that we're using is um, Pacific Biosciences long read sequencing. So she's grasping views of the entire length of the RNA, which is, enables her to address those questions that I was um, raising earlier. And the way that I'm gonna display her, um, her data is uh, as schema schematized as follows. So here's a model gene that's got two introns and she aligns each transcript that she visualizes to that gene. And then she can color it according to whether or not it's partially spliced like this violet colored transcript. It's split, the, the first intron is retained but the second intron has been spliced out for example here. Um, we also have a lot of transcripts as you'll see that are completely spliced and these are the dark purple ones. And then these lighter orange ones are all unspliced. And this is an interesting class of transcripts that we've observed now in a variety of different species that basically retained all of their introns. And we'll look at the properties uh, of these uh, transcripts. So here are a few gene examples, um, just these two, actin and CalR. And what you notice is on a gene specific basis, a difference in the fraction that are unspliced. Uh, and so this is just anecdotal to say that this gene, for example, has more unspliced transcripts than this gene does here. Actin tends to be very efficiently spliced and you see a lot of uh, all spliced uh, type of transcripts. For example, here, the three prime end of, of the transcript. So in other words, the polymerase is in within this exon and the upstream introns have already been removed. And you can see this progression of transcription towards the end of the gene. If we look uh, globally, what, what you can then see is the, um, in the uninduced and the induced cells, you see that there, the fraction of total reads that's all spliced is the uh, vast majority of the reads and there's a smaller fraction that's partially spliced and all unspliced. So these are the major, major categories um, as we look at all of the transcripts. Great, so where is RNA polymerase II when the splicing reaction takes place? Uh, and one way to uh, show this data is to ask for any position of Paul II when the transcript has, is showing us a splice junction, in other words, step two is completed, where is that Paul two? How much further downstream is it from that splice junction or the three prime splice site as you see here, we're measuring that distance. And it turns out when we um, plot the data in that way, you can see that 150 nucleotides downstream of the three prime splice site or the splice junction, depending how you're measuring it, um, you, you find the position of Paul II. In other words, by the time the polymerase has mostly finished transcribing the downstream exon, the two exons have been joined together. And so we would call this efficient uh, co-transcriptional splicing. One question we're interested in addressing is whether or not the polymerase might pause within exon two, let's say, or at the three prime splice site, or even at the downstream five prime splice site in order to explain this 
um, very rapid co-transcriptional splicing behavior that we're observing. And so we teamed up with uh, Karen Edelman's lab and we conducted ProSeq in these cells. And what you can see is though, the, you can easily detect uh, Paul 2 pausing at the promoter, in other words, promoter proximal pausing. We couldn't detect uh, pausing at five prime splice sites or at three prime splice sites, either in a meta-analysis, as you can see here for all genes, or if we, even if we divided up genes according to the efficiency of splicing. In other words, these are the very highly uh, efficient um, genes. The blue ones are the guys who were spliced super, super efficiently. And we don't see uh, pausing at either um, land gene landmark uh, compared to any of the other um, splicing efficiencies. So it doesn't seem that Paul 2 pausing is explaining this behavior. The really interesting biology comes out when we started to look at actually the gene that we were aiming to look at, which was uh, beta globin. So a lot of a lot is known about beta globin splicing. Beta globin RNA was one of the very first in vitro transcripts uh, for studying splicing. Um, it's known that in vivo uh, beta globin is not very well, um, or I should say, less efficiently spliced than you might expect. Uh, this was uh, reported early on by Lynn McQuat and led largely to um, the discovery of nonsense mediated decay, but that's maybe another story. Um, what I wanna mention is that we observed, Kirsten observed the presence of these unspliced transcripts, the gold ones here, that actually are completely unspliced in this case up here at the top, and that actually read past the poly A cleavage site. So this red line marks where normally uh, transcripts would be cleaved at the three prime end, released from chromatin and subsequently polyadenylated. But instead in these all unspliced transcripts, the polymerase keeps going because the, you know, because the three prime end hasn't been cleaved. And this is the proseq uh, to match these traces. Uh, and so um, in characterizing, this is not the only gene uh, that does this in the male cells. You can see that in, um, if you look at um, uncleaved reads in general throughout the whole data set, you can see that the majority um, are all unspliced, actually in this point, not the majority, but a, a large fraction are all unspliced and um, less are all spliced and partially spliced. And this sort of fraction depends on how far we've taken out the window for the, for the read through phenomenon. So um, this is kind of a conservative way of plotting the data. There's a strong correlation, let me say, between the failure to splice and the failure to cleave at the three prime end. And, um, and Kirsten discovered something very interesting when we went and looked at a variant uh, version of this gene that came from a patient with thalassemia. So here she was looking at a thalassemic mutation at the three prime splice site that leads to the alternative use of an upstream three prime splice site marked by the, the triangle here. And it turns out, um, we, which we didn't expect, um, this mutation is actually used more efficiently in co-transcriptional splicing and leads to, so you can see the um, increased amount of intron removal when we plot the metadata um, and what you see also comparing the wild type, which is shown in purple, and the orange, which is the thalassemic mutation, you see a decrease in the read-through past the poly A cleavage site. And so here in this physiological example, a uh, mutation that causes uh, thalassemia in humans, um, that the more efficiently you splice your RNA, um, the better you cleave at the three prime end, uh, suggesting this um, a strong coupling between splicing and three prime end cleavage. We can look at that again um, in a different example. And now I'm showing you some data from budding yeast. So this is a completely different story, but it comes down to a, uh, similarly showing this correlation between um, read through transcription and splicing. And so in budding yeast, we also notice that even in control wild type cells, there's no problems here. Splicing is very efficient. But when splicing has not completed in these blue transcripts, when splicing hasn't completed, when the polymerase reads, reaches the end of the gene, 
there is transcriptional read through and a failure to cleave at the three prime end. Tara Alpert, as part of her thesis, was trying to um, study this and other phenomena in budding yeast. And she looked at a mutation in NAB2. And this is an anchors away strain, NAB2's uh, required gene. And when she, the reason she was interested in it is that there was a paper saying that NAB2 might have a role in splicing, and we wanted to test that. And her observation when she uh, used the anchors away strain to deplete NAB2 was that actually there's a lot of transcriptional read through now in the absence of NAB2, which is independent of whether or not the transcript has been spliced. So here we see spliced as well as unspliced transcripts. And in this case, a large pileup of, of read through transcripts. So in, in this data, what we would conclude is that NAB2 has a role in uh, three prime end cleavage and therefore transcription termination. Um, but we don't see a role for NAB2 in splicing if we compare uh, control versus NAB2 anchors away. Um, an interesting uh, side discovery that she made, um, which explains why it was initially identified as a splicing factor is shown here. I keep losing my pointer, I apologize. Okay, now um, this is the gene that we were just looking at. And um, what I wanna point out is that you can have um, in what we're calling intrusive transcripts or transcripts that will cross from one gene into the next gene and these are the transcripts that are not spliced. So focus on what I'm, what I'm gonna show you here as an example. So here's an upstream gene, it happens to have an intron, and in the, in the control as well as in the mutant, you can have read through into the downstream gene. And what happens when we have this read through into the downstream gene, this YPL079W affectionately uh, termed, is that these intrusive transcripts are not spliced. So it's inhibiting splicing to have all this upstream sequence attached, presumably, uh, to these nascent transcripts. And that's why if you do a bulk assay, you'd actually conclude that the NAB2 depletion is interrupting splicing. And, but it seems like the more direct explanation is that the depletion of NAB2 is interrupting three prime end cleavage and then it's the read through that's directly leading to the splicing phenotype. So we feel that this long read sequencing method is really um, giving us new insights into the molecular functions of different factors that in population bulk studies um, are giving us, let's say a splicing phenotype. And when we go and look at individual transcripts, we start to see um, additional mechanistic information like this. So what can we con conclude from what I've shown you in part one? Um, so we've been looking at this coordination between transcription and the removal of these introns, looking at these transient intermediates along the pathway to producing mature spliced RNA. And when we ask what are the substrates for pre-mRNA splicing in vivo, at least a very large fraction of the nascent transcripts that we've been analyzing suggest that basically exon one is getting progressively larger as uh, introns are fairly efficiently removed uh, as the polymerase moves down the gene. So this, for this transcript, this might be seen more as a splicing substrate by the time the polymerase gets down towards the end of the gene as compared to how you might have previously imagined it um, if, if splicing had been less efficient. And this might have implications for splicing mechanisms since this very long exon one uh, might have its say five prime splice site much further away from the five prime end cap, which is supposed to have a role in splicing. The sequences of all these exons have now been piled up together. Maybe positive or negative acting regulatory sequences might behave differently with respect to the removal of this intron than they might have um, acted previously when they were on an exon surrounded by introns. So I think it's gonna be really interesting to try to parse out these dynamic events and their uh, consequences for splicing mechanism. 
Where along the gene does splicing take place? Does PALT and does PALT2 pause? This has been a sort of controversial theme in the field. Um, and at least what our data is telling us is that splicing often completes when the polymerase is in the downstream exon and that pausing, transcriptional pausing is not involved. Is RNA processing coordinated at the single transcript level? The fact that we see introns uh, correlated, their removal correlated with each other, I didn't be labeled at that point, but you could have a look at the paper if you're interested, um, but also correlated with free prim and cleavage, as I emphasized, um, really does point to the possibility that there's um, transcripts are marked to be either efficiently or inefficiently spliced for presumably some physiological reason. And that the splicing efficiency um, increases three prime end cleavage, or if it's inefficient, decreases three prime end cleavage, we think is actually uh, probably important for determining the um, gene output. And I'm going to come to an example of that in a few minutes as I start up the next um, section of the, of the talk. So I'm at the end of part one, and I wonder if anyone has uh, a question. Maybe we could take one or two questions. I'm just looking at my clock, and I want to make sure I don't run out of time for the next part. Yeah, Mats, do we have uh, do we I, have any questions? Okay, I think we just got one question here, uh, and a few here. So, so given that it seems successful splicing signals to the cleavage and polyadenylation machinery. How might splicing coordination impact alternative polyadenylation site choice? This is the first question. Okay, so um, this is a real, this is a, you know, this is a really good question that we haven't addressed. Is the is the accurate answer? We um, we need to look at that. It's a really very fascinating question, and as you know. Uh, in mammalian cells, I can see it's Matt Gamble asking that question. Um, as you know, uh, splicing factors like SR proteins can coordinate the choice of alternative splice site together with alternative polyadenylation site. And so this would be something that would be really uh, fantastic to dissect um, in future studies. And we definitely have that planned. So I think I'll just stop there. Uh, another question from uh, Alice here. Uh, she's asking, uh, could all or non-splicing reflect the subnuclear localization? Okay, so that's a terrific uh, question. Thanks, Alice. Um, that's a great question. Actually, you know, you could imagine if a gene is in heterochromatin or euchromatin, um, there could be an influence of histone tail modifications. Um, there's some evidence that histone tail modifications um, could influence the recruitment of positive or negative acting splicing factors. Um, and so that's, that's definitely one idea. One of my favorite ideas is that there might be states inside of cells, and I'm about to mention some of these, you know, in a population of cells, um, where cells just aren't splicing. For example, a mitotic cell uh, where transcription tends to turn off. Um, and at least in there are some studies that suggest that splicing activity may be diminished also in mitosis. Um, maybe that's those transcripts come from um, a, a set of cells, you know, that are in a particular stage of the cell cycle or they're stressed or they're aged or something like this. So I think that um, there are some great contexts for, for us to look and we have um, these, these experiments are planned and being done. <laughs> uh, a question of uh, Carla. So the, if, if the splicing machinery misses an intron, does that transcript, do you think it's gonna be spliced later or is it gonna be turned over? So this is also a great question that we're very interested in. As you may know, there are uh, classes of introns that are retained or detained, depending who you're talking to. There's um, in certain kinds of cells like macrophages, it seems that there are expression programs where the intron will be detained or retained for a while and then spliced later. So there's certainly in certain physiological conditions, examples where their splicing is much delayed and will occur later, uh, presumably post-transcriptionally after 3 prime end cleavage. 
On the other hand, we have data from um, S. Pombi that suggests that, that these transcripts that re have retained introns are subjected to um, nuclear degradation by the exosome. And so we would guess that um, in many cases that this would lead to reduced gene expression. And so that's something um, that we also are, are interested in following up on. To what extent does um, inefficient splicing contribute to a reduction in gene expression um, by that gene for you know, whatever potentially regulatory reason? Yeah. OK, well, thank you. Maybe on to part two? Yes, let's go on to part right, two. Uh, this is a really exciting part, as I've alluded to previously, this is going to be on Cajal bodies, and I'm really going to be focusing on assembly of the Cajal body. Um, I wanted to review a few of the salient facts about Cajal bodies just in words at the beginning so that I can get on to um, what we've learned recently about um, how, how the molecules get together and assemble this uh, amazing body. Um, and so first, what you need to know is that the spliceosomal SNRPs assemble in the CB. This is a coincidence, perhaps, in, spa in, in, in space, right? So this doesn't tell us it's important. It just tells us that we, 20 years ago, David Staniak in my lab showed using um, FRET that transient intermediates in the process of forming the tri -SNRP could be detected in Cajal bodies. Um, and this included U4, U6 annealing and their association with U5. Now, we also have found previously that snow RNPs actually traffic through Cajal bodies en route to the nucleolus. And we speculate that this is also due to steps in their assembly. Um, but the really important uh, fact that we were able to establish in zebrafish and Greg Matera's lab was uh, able to show in mouse is that if you don't have Cajal bodies, certainly in zebrafish, um, the loss of Cajal bodies was lethal. And in mouse, he came up with a term, semi, the term semi-lethal for the phenomenon where you have very few homozygous um, deletions of the scaffolding pro protein um, in the mice, in the babies that emerge um, from, a, from an F1 cross um, in the mouse. And so suggesting that in embryogenesis, for some reason, you need these Cajal bodies. Now, recall our model is that the Cajal bodies make sp um, splice these SNRP assembly more efficient. And so our explanation is that as embryos turn on their zygotic genome, they really need a steady supply of SNRPs in order to remove the introns from those zygotic transcripts. Okay, so why again should we focus on assembly? I'm just gonna show you a quick movie that Martin Maschino when he was in my lab uh, took. And the point of this is just to show you some of the dynamics. We're gonna focus in on this cell here. Um, look at these two nice Cajal bodies. This is in G2 when Cajal bodies tend to be you know, fairly discrete and pretty large. And what you'll see is as they enter mitosis, the cell enters mitosis, the Cajal bodies will dissolve and then reform through some interesting process where you have a lot of little tiny ones and then they seem to coalesce into a set of uh, larger ones. So we'll just play that now and you can see these two um, CBs, nobody's home when we're dividing. And now we see the little tiny guys start to regenerate, get bigger. And as we get towards S phase, and, you know, and this is very similar to what the nucleolus is doing. So these two membraneless organelles uh, involved in RNA processing um, are disassembling at mitosis and reassembling um, in G1. And we know that they're important for those RNA processing events that are going to take place in interphase. Okay, so what uh, is an explanation for this? Now, Martin Maschino, when he was in my lab, showed that you could actually chip the scaffolding protein of Cajal bodies coilin to the gene loci where the snRNAs are encoded. So here's an example of the chip signal at U2, U3, and U5 loci compared to the background chip. And so this suggests that the Cajal body is really built on uh, these gene loci. And in fact, they come from different chromosomes. He also found that coilin um, clips or crosslinks to these same RNAs. And so our model uh, is that coilin, the scaffolding protein, can bind 
to um, the nascent RNA that comes from these active genes. And of course, this may explain the movie that I just showed you, because during mitosis, uh, transcription of these genes is shut off and therefore the Cajal body may um, disassemble. So we know that our, we, in our model, RNA plays a role. Um, and um, I wanted to, okay. And then I want to show you an example now where we're gonna be looking at three prime end cleavage and a possible connection to the Cajal body. So I wanna tell you that stress disrupts three prime end cleavage and now raise the possibility that splicing might be involved. This is a little bit of an aside, an aside, but following on part one of my talk, I thought you guys might find this interesting. So this is a study from my colleague, Joan Steitz's lab down the hall. And she found in osmotic stress that what happens is, now here's, here's my favorite dog gene. It's um, CXXC4. It has two introns here. It's a very simple, short gene. But what happens when you um, in, introduce osmotic stress is transcription continues for a very long time. Here's the scale bar, 10 KB. And the cause of this is a failure to cleave at the three prime splice site. And this is a very widespread phenomenon in, in the case of heat shock or osmotic stress. And so a tie in to this part on the Cajal body is that stress also disrupts Cajal bodies, which as we've just said, uh, assemble all this splicing machinery. And so here's a picture of cells with Cajal bodies marked by the scaffolding protein coilin and another protein you're gonna hear a lot about SMN. And what happens in osmotic stress or in heat shock is that these bodies disassemble. So again, um, raising the, the possibility that the assembly and disassembly dynamics of Cajal bodies could be important, not only to the function uh, in assembling the, sp um, the splicing machinery, but in the chromosome topology inside these cells. So if you reflect back to our model, where the Cajal body actually pulls in different regions of chromosomes that happen to have these genes on, on them, see the chromosome numbers, then, what, then we can imagine what happens in stress. Do these chromosomes actually spring apart and change their position inside of cells? Is that important? Uh, and do Cajal bodies help cells recover from stress as a result of pulling these chromosomes back into position? These are questions that we're currently asking in the lab and I'm sorry that I can't answer them um, today for you today. Okay, so how does the scaffolding protein coilin promote Cajal body assembly? That's what we're gonna concentrate on for the rest of the talk, um, along with its friends. And um, I'll tell you first about our assumptions. So of course we read the literature and we know that intrinsically disordered regions in proteins can play an important role in biomolecular condensation or the formation of these membraneless organelles. Um, and so if we just look at the sort of layout of this protein where there's a putative self interaction at the end terminus, we call this the NTD. Um, there are interactions with, for example, spliceosomal SNRPs down here at the C terminus. Um, and then there are interactions with this other protein that I pointed you to, SMN. Um, those are intermolecular interactions, but then there's this intrinsically disordered region in the middle. It's not very well conserved. And we thought, well, maybe we have biomolecular condensation as a result of this um, intrinsically disordered region. Anybody would come up with that hypothesis, I think. Okay. So what's our perfectly reasonable model one? is exactly what I just said, that with their weak interactions due to the action of this intrinsically disordered region, then these promote condensation, and that these other interactions that I just described to you are stronger interactions, and those lend some specificity, and that would explain why we would come up with a Cajal body, which is a round thing that has SNRPs in it. Okay, great. Okay, so Ed Kershane was working on this problem. He was very frustrated because, well, you know, it was hard. And so what he decided to do was say, look, I'm gonna line up uh, our three favorite molecules that are involved in Cajal body formation. Basically, if you deplete all of these, you will impact Cajal body formation. The strongest one is coilin. And so he thought, I'm gonna treat these guys as a set of interesting players. And I'm gonna ask which Cajal body proteins which, and which pieces of them contain these domains that promote biomolecular condensation. Okay, so here are three guys, 
SMN is the protein whose absence causes spinal muscular atrophy in children. It's got a tutor domain um, that's a folded 60 amino acid domain that binds dimethyl arginine. And it's, that region is flanked by low complexity intrinsically disordered regions to the side. So we thought these could actually help form uh, biomolecular condensates. And also NOP140 is a protein that's pleasant, present in the nucleolus, also heavily intrinsically disordered. So it, how was Ed gonna test this? So what he did was he borrowed a, um, an assay from Cliff Brangwin's lab, this diagrammed here on the right. Basically you hook up a test domain. And so he chopped up these proteins into little, you know, little domains and he attached them to mCherry and this CRY2 domain. Now this, what is CRY2? It's a dimerization domain that is induced by light. It comes from plants. And when you shine light on cells, so here's a cell, a hypothetical cell expressing our protein. And when you shine the light on the cells, what happens is the CRY2 domain dimerizes. And if you have a domain that promotes uh, through weak interactions, liquid-liquid uh, phase separation, you'll, you will observe these large uh, bodies forming over time in cells. And if that's not the case, you will simply have this uniform signal throughout the cell. So what did Ed expect? He basically thought this tutor domain from SMN is my control experiment. It's highly folded. It's 60 amino acids. It binds to dimethyl arginine. This thing is for sure not going to do it. We didn't really know what to expect from the coil in regions, but remember we hypothesized that this intrinsically disordered region probably would make blobs. And not when 40 g that, that looks like a really good candidate for blob making. Well, the surprise in the first experiment is as follows. It was the folded tutor domain that formed the opto droplets. And so I'll just play this movie for you. So here you can see the uh, folded tutor domain is the test domain here. And you can see that over time when the lights shifted on, it forms these biomolecular condensates both in the nucleus and in the cytoplasm. Okay, so right away we had kind of a perplexing and exciting result since as I've told you, the, SM, the tutor domain is a folded domain that binds dimethyl arginine. Here is what it looks like. This is Michael Sattler's paper showing NMR and NMR structure of, this, um, of uh, the aromatic cage within the tutor domain and showing how these green aromatic amino acids hang on to symmetrical dimethyl arginine in, in the pocket. So interestingly also, this amino acid when mutated to lysine causes that uh, childhood disease I mentioned, SMA. So remember this is the SMN tutor domain and it's important for the function of the protein by binding to dimethyl arginine. So what Ed did to validate that this domain was actually folded and carrying out this function is he made mutations in each one of these individual amino acids. And together with Andrew Barentine from Jörg Babersdorf's lab, they came up with a clustering metric that plots the degree of clustering versus the protein concentration inside of cells, which we thought was a really important parameter to control for the amount of protein present um, in the cell. So what you can see is over a range of concentrations of our expression construct, we have biomolecular condensation by the wild type tutor domain. And that is completely abolished by each one of these individual mutations in the aromatic cage. So this is due to binding endogenous cellular ligands um, of the tutor domain. So to summarize the results of his screen, I now will reveal to you that indeed the NOP140 intrinsically disordered region also does this biomolecular condensation, but that none of the coiling domains were capable of doing this, including the intrinsically disordered regions. And so this caused us to revise our um, model completely. We don't believe that the intrinsically disordered region promotes condensation. Instead, we know that condensation can be promoted by the tutor domain and by this very long intrinsically disordered protein NOP140. Okay, so let's try to understand first uh, a little bit more about what Coilin is doing and that's gonna reveal the role of NOP140. So we're gonna focus in on the N-terminal domain of Coilin. Here it is. So it's the N-terminal domain, not much is known about it. It's uh, predicted 
to be a ubiquitin like fold um, shown below here. And you can see that there are many, um, there are many conserved amino acids as we look through evolution. And so one thing that Martin Maschina was able to do was to mutate each one of these indicated amino acids to alanine. So these are conserved amino acids. Um, he mutated the, them to alanine and asked, what effect does this have on Cajal body formation? And the results were really very striking. Many of these single amino acid mutations changed drastically the morphology of Cajal bodies. So here I'm showing you what um, wild type cells look, uh, a wild type construct looks like in HeLa cells. Okay, so um, this is a setup. We've got the N-terminal domain fused to an NLS and it goes into the nucleus. And you can see the red that comes from that construct going into the nucleus. These cells have their own endogenous coilin, their HeLa cells, and they have therefore these Cajal bodies that are co-localized together with this introduced um, N-terminal domain. And we rationalize that the N-terminal domain had previously been implicated by Greg Matera's lab in self interactions. So in other words, two, maybe two or more coilin molecules interacting with one another. Now, when we look at these mutations, these two here, arginine to alanine eight and uh, aspartate to alanine 79, these disrupt the formation of these round objects. And they have a dominant negative effect on the endogenous coilin. They take apart Cajal bodies that were previously there. So these are very fascinating players who suggest that they're involved maybe in those self-self interactions. And I'll show you why we think that's true. Here's my favorite mutation. Arginine 36 to alanine mutation causes the formation of these oligomers in the nucleus. And this is also dominant negative. It causes the endogenous coilin to glue itself onto these oligomers in the nucleus, taking over the wild type molecules. So what do we think is going on here? This is a predicted structure. Remember I told you it looks like a ubiquitin-like fold. And if we go and look where those particular amino acids are located, these two guys, arginine 8 and aspartate 79, that caused this complete disruption we propose that they're involved in coilin-coilin interactions. And on the other face, we've got this arginine 36, and we would propose that this might be involved in interactions with NOP140. I'm gonna tell you why we think that this is the case um, in the next few slides. First, as an example, some FRET experiments. Let's focus on the bottom left for starters. Okay, so we said that this face might be involved in coil and coil and interactions and the FRET shows that that's the case by looking at the R8A mutation, you can see that the substantial indirect FRET signal is reduced to nothing in the R8A mutation. The D79 mutation is less dramatic. I agree with that, but this is consistent with our hypothesis that this face is um, where the coilin coilin interaction takes place. Now we can also do coilin NOP140 FRED. And coilin NOP140 FRED is taken apart by this R36A mutation. This is the one that causes filament formation. So if you interrupt an interaction with NOP140, now coilin oligomerization goes wild. That's our, that's our hypothesis. And we have lots of data that's consistent with it. This is my favorite data. NOP140 is a nuclear protein. Um, if you put the coilin and terminal domain by leaving off its NLS, if you put it into the cytoplasm, it makes filaments. Out there in the cytoplasm, there is no NOP140 and it makes these filaments. If you put the N terminal domain, as I showed you before, into the nucleus, it joins Cajal bodies and it makes round things. So, um, NOP140 together with the N-terminal domain of coilin alone can make round things. I forgot to tell you that these cells are lacking in um, endogenous coilin. These, this is a cell line that lacks coilin. So the N-terminal domain in the nucleus together with NOP140, if we knock down NOP140, that's not the case, but it'll make these um, round nuclear bodies that kind of look like Cajal bodies. Okay. 
So what we think is going on now with Coilin is that the N-terminal domain is incapable of oligomerizing and that its association with NOP140 is what somehow limits oligomerization. And if you're missing NOP140, you um, can form these long oligomers as we saw out in the cytoplasm and also with RNAi, which I didn't have time to show you. And this is very fascinating because if we look at endogenous um, Cajal bodies by EM, you can see that they're kind of, they look like wrapped up oligomers almost. So I'm wondering if NOP140 limits the oligomerization of coilin, it makes the oligomers shorter, or alternative, alternatively, there could be quite long oligomers of, of coilin forming in nuclei, but the NOP140 kind of wraps them up like a jelly roll and uh, causes them to form this, um, this you know, one micron in diameter uh, Cajal body that we observe in the light microscope. I'm gonna be telling you a bit more about the lay, layout of this Cajal body in just a minute as I enter the final um, set of data surrounding this um, assembly problem. Okay, where are we with our model? Um, so I told you about the oligomerization of coilin, which um, we hadn't really understood before, but now we believe is due to this N-terminal domain and that the interaction of the N-terminal domain with each other causes oligomerization, but with NOP140 causes the formation of biomolecular condensate in the nucleus. What is the role of the SMN molecule now? Recall that Edward found that the Tudor domain leads to uh, biomolecular condensation by interacting with endogenous uh, dimethyl arginine mo modified proteins in the nucleus as well as in the cytoplasm. Let's learn more about this interaction. And what I'm going to be telling you is, just so you're sort of ready, is that Cajal bodies essentially dock together with nuclear gems um, using this interaction. So, so where do we get that idea? This is uh, a slide intended to tell you about the composition of the Cajal body and what, the, what we've termed the role of a Tudor, the Tudor domain, DMA, dimethyl arginine interaction. Here's how Cajal bodies look now in a really nice uh, uh, image, fluorescence imaging setup where when Edward comes into your office, you say, this has to be chromatic aberration because look at how the coilin staining is offset from the SMN staining, right? This, these are not exactly overlapping. And then Edward very smartly says back to me, well, that can't possibly be true because look at the orientation of that so-called chromatic aberration, Professor Neugebauer. It's oriented in different directions. So that cannot be the explanation. He's quite right. It turns out that this arrangement of coilin and SMN, which we collectively think of as the Cajal body, uh, is dependent on which type of dimethyl arginine you have. So let's look down here. We've used an ADMA inhibitor, a, a chemical inhibitor that prevents the formation of um, asymmetric dimethyl arginine on proteins. And what happens here is we have the complete overlap between the SMN and the coilin signal. Now these signals are completely in register with one another. In contrast, if we use the SDMA inhibitor, the symmetric dimethyl arginine inhibitor, now these two um, bodies are completely mislocalized with each other. They separate. And here you can see the coilin, the green signal, is completely separate from the pink, the SMN signal. OK, so the composition, whether or not a Cajal body has SMN, is determined by which kinds of dimethyl arginine um, are present in the nucleus. And the real extreme example is shown up here when we add the ADMA and the SDMA inhibitors at the same time, you can see these nuclear gems, which is this SMN accumulation together with other proteins called gemins, um, is still occurs, but the um, unity with coil, uh, coilin biomolecular condensates is completely gone. And you could suggest that the, that the coal bodies are disassembling from this data. So we wondered what is the actual arrangement of the coilin with the SNN and uh, how does 
uh, the the tutor DMA interaction determine um, how these different sets of molecules interact with one another. And so what Edward um, did, he's actually half time with Jörg Babersdorf's lab right now, is looked at the um, very high resolution images of coilin and SMN using a method called STED, and this is ISOSTED, a method that Babersdorf lab has developed that um, has um, isometric um, resolution in all dimensions and enables the um, collection of this data, which we can use to render uh, surfaces and show the form that the coilin labeled domain uh, makes in relation to the SMN labeled domain. And what you can see here is kind of like a baseball mitt uh, formed by the coilin side. And the SMN is kind of tucked like the baseball into the pocket of the coilin. So what would it look like when we add some of the inhibitors? So here you can see the STED images um, treated with either untreated, where you see the SMNs kind of sitting on the top of this particular Cajal body, and then these merge when we use the ADMA inhibitor. So the center of mass of, um, of the two fluorescent signals um, coalesces um, when we've, um, and, and they, overlap uh, when we add this inhibitor as we saw before in this example over here. So the substructure and the composition of the Cajal body depends on what we're calling this tutor DMA interaction. And now I'm looking at the clock and I wanna finish up. I apologize uh, for the late hour, but I wanna tell you that the tutors are coming. There are many tutor domains in the human proteome. In fact, there are 55 annotated um, tutor domains in 28 different proteins. And it tends to be that the way these proteins look, unlike SMN and a couple of other simple looking proteins, they tend to have an array of different tutor domains, as you can see in these examples. And the green ones are ones that we've tested in our assay and have shown evidence for biomolecular condensation. So you can see some examples down here with the, where the lights turned on. All of these different tutor domains are forming biomolecular condensates by interacting with um, what are as yet unknown um, dimethyl arginine mod modified ligands. And so what's really exciting for us is uh, the chance to go in now and characterize those um, DMA containing protein ligands at each of these tutor domains. Um, these are, as I said, again, unknown. But if you look at the um, lo localization and potential functions of these tutor domain containing proteins, some of those functions are known, but others are present in germ granules and chromatin, stress granules and transcriptional regulation. These are all uh, functions and locations inside of cells where we would not be surprised to see a role for biomolecular condensation. And so we're really excited about um, going into this. Um, so I had a model slide, but I think um, in the interest of time, we'll um, go directly to the questions. I wanna first of all, thank um, my lab. Um, so these are the students, the postdocs and undergraduate students. Also Andrew Berentine from your Baversdorf's lab, uh, Lucky, uh, Martin Machina, a former um, uh, PhD student who contributed a lot to this study. And I hope we have time for a few questions. Um, I'll just maybe put, uh, put this slide up as a, as a final image. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carla. It was a wonderful talk. Um, uh, we're running kind of late, but let, let's have, yeah. there's two questions here in the file here, Q&A. So one is, do any of the mutations in the Cajal uh, bodies related proteins impact the PML bodies that are neighbors adjacent to Cajal bodies? Is there any imp impact in there? Um, uh, we don't know. We haven't looked at uh, PML bodies. Um, and so that's a good idea that we extend this uh, to other nuclear bodies. Um, we, I've never noticed in our cell lines the, a relationship between PML bodies and Cajal bodies. But um, if you say that I should be looking at PML bodies, then we'll look at PML bodies. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, another question is, is regarding stress. Um, 
how does the stress affect the coiling and the knob 140? Do they not interact anymore under stress? That's a really great question. So one thing that we do know is we used our chip assay to ask uh, when we apply the stress, and we do this for a short period of time, 30 minutes or an hour, um, and then if we do chip, we don't see the coiling on the chromatin anymore. So the coiling has left the chromatin. Um, and so that would be consistent with the microscopy result that we get. Um, we haven't yet tested uh, whether the coil and op 140 interaction um, uh, is disrupted by stress, but that's certainly on our list of possible, you know, possible mechanisms. Yep. Okay, I, I think we have to do the last question here. So okay. uh, the question is, when you disrupted Cajal bodies with stress, did U3 and other snow RMPs still stay in the nucleus or did they diffuse to the cytoplasm? Um, I don't think we, uh, we must have looked at that and I would say then therefore the answer would, is probably no, because we must have done trimethylguanosine or uh, SM, you know, Y12. Um, I, I have to look it up. I don't, I'm not sure. I, I guess I sort of doubt that they'll go out into the cytoplasm, but you know, with stress, all bets are off. <laughs> I'm just not sure. <laughs> that. Thank you so much, Carla. That was, that was great. And uh, I just want to remind everybody that on March 3rd, we're going to have Melissa Moore uh, from Moderna tell us about the history of how they came up with the COVID vaccine. And then of course, on March 25th and 26th, we have our annual symposium. So please stay tuned for that. And with that, uh, thanks again, Carla. And thanks for everyone uh, listening in. It was a, a great uh, symposium or a great talk. Yeah, thank I just you. wanna thank everyone for your questions. I'm, I'm sorry that we didn't have a longer time for questions. It's hard to thank get the you. timing right on Zoom, to be honest, Zoom is very yeah. difficult. <laughs> yeah, all right, thanks everyone. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye.